the TRIP lab over in Wimmer to provide the spatial transcriptomic service with the 10X platform. So today, Egon is here to tell us a little bit more about it and to hopefully give a little bit more um, awareness to the technology and how it can benefit individuals here on campus. So with that, Egon, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks a lot for the introduction and um, thanks for the invite, Sandra and Liz. I'm really happy to be here today and have the opportunity to um, speak with you and meet virtually, uh, meet, meet with you. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, see. Okay, hopefully, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so a couple of things before, before we start. Um, so I will, I will share the, this presentation uh, with you all, um, or you know, Sandra Lee's um, horizon after the uh, um, after the uh, the presentation. So don't worry about taking um, screenshots or too many notes. You're gonna have the slide deck. Um, the the other thing is, uh, feel free to add your questions in the in the chat, and uh, we will do our best to to answer those questions during the presentation after the presentation. But um, if you also have questions that you want to ask live, um, feel free to come up um, to unmute yourself and uh, and ask a question as I as I go through the slide. So yeah, um, so my name is Egon and I'm the science and technology advisor for Tenex Genomics. And um, and so here I'd like to start with a slide, a kind of overview of Tenex, um, what the company is and. Uh, and so we are a young company, but very innovative. And um, over the past seven to eight years, we released more than 20 unique um, solutions in the single cell um, uh, space, uh, single cell genomic space, I should say, and, and also now also in the spatial transcriptomic space. Um, today, uh, we're gonna focus on the uh, Visium spatial transcriptomics. This was initially released in 2019. Uh, and then in 2021, we added uh, FFP capabilities. And I'll go through those details later in my presentation. Now, Visium is one of the uh, pillars we have at Tenex, um, or Visium Spatial Transcriptomics is one of those pillars. We, uh, the other two are the, um, Gino, uh, the Chromium platform, which includes all single cell solutions. Uh, and then we are developing, as we speak, uh, a third pillar or third platform, which is which is called Xenium, and this would be a, this is a new instrument that allows you to do in situ analysis, um, essentially interrogating gene expression and protein expression on FFP uh, and fresh frozen tissue sections uh, with subcellular resolution. And I have a couple of slides toward the end of my presentation that I'd like to show you. All right. So talking about Visium, um, we are really, really proud to see that our, this technology has been featured in many uh, top tier journals um, in 2020, now in, also in 2022, we have the cover in science and the cover in nature as well. And more than that, I should say, we are really um, excited to witness the type, of re the type of research that has been made possible thanks to Visium. And now there are more than 20, um, st uh, 200 studies, sorry, more than 200 studies um, using using the Visium technology, and every, pretty much every day, every week, there are there are new preprints and new peer review publications. Now, um, how did we get to that point? And uh, what I like to maybe talk for a minute or so is perhaps review a methods that have been used uh, to interrogate um, the biology and see the and, in, uh, and better understand the complexity of samples. So. A very common popular method and uh, um, still common is to do RNA sequence, uh, bulk RNA sequencing on a sample. Um, that is very popular, as I said, it is a quick method, um, fairly cheap, I would say. Um, but the, the problem is that uh, it gives you a, an average signal of, let's say, a particular gene across all type of cells that are present in your, in your samples. And samples are formed by many different types of cells. So getting an average signal is not really ideal when we want to understand the composition of that particular sample. So that's why the field moved on and, uh, and developed a single cell approach. And this is great 
because now you can identify all different cell types present in a sample, and you can actually count how many different cell types are present in um, or in each cell sub in each subpopulation, let's say. Um, so great, uh, great advancement. However, what happened? One limitation is well, you start from a tissue, and then you dissociate it into single cell or single nuclei, and you interrogate gene expression or chromatin landscape, but you do dissociate the tissue. And so you essentially lose the um, spatial context of where cells, where genes are expressed within the tissue. That's why um, the field has developed a, a spatial transcriptomics technology that now allows you to maintain the morphological context of cells or genes within the tissue. Uh, what, he, what we have been seeing um, happening more and more often in, in, the, in this area is also the combination of single cell, um, technology, uh, single cell data with spatial transcriptomics data. I have a couple of examples that I'll show you during my presentation, um, but this is, a, you know, is an approach that allows you to get, uh, even more, to get even more information about the type of, about the sample you're studying when you actually combine spatial transcriptomics data with single, with, with single cell data. That's because you can, better, you can get a better granularity of the, of the data of the, of the sample that you are studying. Uh, but let's go back to spatial transcriptomics. So the, the importance of spatial transcriptomics is really um, the ability of maintaining a spatial context while studying or morphological context, spatial context while studying the um, you know, gene the whole transcriptome of a particular tissue section. And so with this technology, we can actually see what lies underneath the a surface of a, of a tissue, like in this case. And, uh, and essentially, Visium allows you to do this. So our platform allows you to interrogate the entire transcriptome of a tissue section uh, while maintaining this, uh, the information of where genes or where cells are expressed within the tissue. And, uh, and with Visium, you will always have two types of orthogonal data set that you, you can use for data analysis. And so on one side, you will always have your, uh, an image of your tissue section, and that can be an h &E staining or an immunofluorescent staining. Uh, and on the other side, you have, you'll have your whole transcriptome data. And so when you carry out an analysis, you can either start, let's say, from your tissue section and um, simply add individual genes one by one up to the entire transcriptome and see where those genes are expressed within the tissue, as we can see here. Or you can first manually annotate uh, the gene expression cluster using the whole transcriptome data. And so you will be able to identify different cell populations. And then by overlaying this data on top of the, on top of the um, tissue section, you'll be able to see where cells are present um, within, the, within the tissue. And one important uh, thing I'd like to mention is that the, the clustering we see here, it's not, ba it's not um, made based on the morphology of the, of the tissue. So clustering is uniquely established based on gene expression uh, data. It doesn't have anything to do with the morphology of the tissue. Now, it happens that cluster will actually overlay pretty well with the morphology of the tissue, but that is because of the biology of, of what we are studying, not because they are uh, established based on the morphology. And, uh, and so there are many type of questions you can um, answer with Visium. Um, here, I just, uh, I will say listed a bunch of them, including um, identify new cell, uh, new cell types or new cell states, uh, identify bio biomarkers, or simply comparing um, a healthy tissue versus a you know, cancer tissue, for instance. Uh, the entire solution comes pre-kitted, and importantly, no instrumentation is required to run Visio. Now, um, in, uh, in 2019, we released the first, ver the first version, first chemistry of Visium um, that was, was only compatible with fresh frozen tissue. And um, this is what we consider a species agnostic solution because we profile the native mRNA. And so as long as we have a, a reference that we can work with, um, we can pretty much profile any species. Now in June, 2021, 
we developed a completely new chemistry in order to have compatibility with FFP tissues. And, uh, we, and that's, that's essentially, we didn't want to adapt an existing chemistry for a completely different type of tissue. So we developed this new chemistry uh, and the new chemistry for FFP uses a probe-based approach. So we have probe sets they will target approximately 18,000 protein coding genes in human and 20,000 protein coding genes in mouse. And even though we use probes, those will still cover the, um, the entire transcriptome of, uh, of, of, that, of, that, of that species. Uh, now, an important um, consideration regarding Visium is that it really enables through discovery because you will always look at the entire tissue section. So you don't need to, let's say, use biomarkers um, and pre-select region of, of interest that you want to study. You will always look at the entire tissue section and then during data analysis using our um, software, you can focus on, on the entire tissue section or focus on a particular region of the tissue. And I'll show you a slide in, in a couple of minutes. Um, so when it comes to staining the tissue section, uh, two, two things I would like to say, one is, you can use HNE or you can use um, immunofluorescence. Um, and when it comes to immunofluorescence, um, you can have up to five different antibodies plus DAPI, so six top colors in total. Uh, the second thing I'd like to mention is that uh, the slide that you'll be staining, uh, sorry, the tissue section you'll be staining is, is the very same tissue section that you will be using for gene expression. So. Um, you don't need to prepare consecutive sections. Um, you essentially stay in the very same tissue section that you'd be then using for gene expression analysis. And so from the same tissue section, you can potentially get up to three uh, information that are gene expression, protein expression, and, and morphology. And here I'm, I would like to give you a 30,000 feet overview of, how the, of what the workflow looks like. So of course, everything starts with sample prep. Um, you will need to have your tissue um, either embedded in, in uh, OCT or FFP embedded. Um, and the first thing you do is to prepare a tissue section or sec uh, section your tissues and place uh, those sections within the capture areas that we have on the gene expression slide. There are four capture areas, and so each one will, will contain a tissue section. Then um, as you start the workflow, you will first uh, stain the, the uh, section, again, HNE or immunofluorescence, and then you take an image and you save this image. You go back to your lab or to the bench um, and uh, complete the library prep. All reagents for library prep are included, by the way, are included in the kit we provide. Um, at the very end of the workflow, you have a sequenceable library that can immediately go on an, on an Illumina um, sequencer. And then on the opposite end of the workflow, we also provide a uh, fully integrated uh, bioinformatics pipeline for, for data analysis that, and those are free uh, of charge. So you just need to download them from our website. Now, the key or the core of the technology is represented by the gene expression slide. So he, this is a, like a microscope slide um, that contains those four capture areas where you'd be placing your tissue section on. And each capture area is 6.5 millimeters square and contains approximately 5,000 barcoded spots. Each spot is 55 micron in diameter and it's coded with millions of those oligos that will all terminate with a poly DT tail. And so this will be the sequence that will capture the native mRNA released from um, fresh frozen uh, section or it will capture probe, the probes that we use in the, in the FFP section. And I'll show you a diagram in a second. Um, then if you look, if you look at, the, um, at the oligos, we also see a spatial barcode sequence here. So this sequence is unique, is unique to each of those um, colored spots. So different, different color, different spots will have a different spatial barcodes. And this is the sequence that essentially tell us the, the address of where um, genes are expressed within the tissue. And thanks to this information, we can now relate, uh, again, where genes are expressed within the tissue, um, thanks to combining um, 
sequencing data and the, and the image that, that we capture. Uh, now, the, um, the gene expression slide that we use for FFP or fresh frozen is exactly the same, but what it, what it changes is the chemistry we use and what we capture on the slide. So for fresh frozen tissue, we, again, we capture the native mRNA that is released from tissue section. For FFPE, we first use probes to target, um, to identify the expressed genes, and then we capture those, those probes. Now, here we have a, again, a high level overview of the fresh frozen um, workflow. And uh, what, what happened essentially is after permeabilization, the mRNA molecules are released from the tissue sections and those are captured by the oligos attached to the, to the slide. Uh, we first generate a full length cDNA, um, as we can see in, in here. This, uh, this cDNA will be barcoded. Then we generate a second strand um, cDNA. We, we run a um, cDNA amplification reaction so, so, so that we have enough material uh, to continue with the workflow. And then, um, we, then we're going to use a small percentage of this amplified cDNA to create a library that can go on the, on the Lumina sequencer. And, uh, and because we capture the native mRNA from the tissue, um, we can pretty much profile any species as long as, of course, we have a reference to, that we can work with. Uh, with FFP, it's a little bit different. And one thing I didn't mention before is um, one of the reasons why we use probes instead of capturing the native mRNA is because um, the RNA will be more degraded in FFP tissues compared to fresh frozen. And so we can't really profile the native mRNA. We need a different strategy. And this strategy comes in the form of using probes. And so for each target, for each gene, Essentially, we have a, a pair of probes that will identify the, uh, the targets. If you see here, uh, one, of those one of those probes um, contains a, or is conjugated to a synthetic poly A tail. And so um, during the workflow, um, the, those probes will hybridize to their target RNA, then they will ligate. Um, we, are, we digest the RNA, and then we permeabilize the tissue so that those probes will be released. And because we have this synthetic poly A, now we can capture the probes using the same poly DT oligos attached to the um, gene expression slide. And so from this point on, instead of making a full length CDNA, we, we don't have CDNA, we have probes. So uh, we essentially, we barcode the probes. And then at the end of the workflow, we end up with uh, um, a sequenceable library that can immediately go on a Illumina uh, sequencer. And again, we target approximately 18,000 protein coding genes in, in human and 20,000 in, in mouse, and that will cover the whole transcriptor. Now, during data analysis, again, this is a, something I really like about Visium is that you can either look at the entire tissue section or, or you can focus on any particular region of your tissue without the need for, um, R, um, or the, without the need to pre select region of interest before before actually running the experiment. And so what my colleague is doing here on the left side is simply looking at the entire tissue section. Um, this is, by the, by the way, is done in, in our Loop Browser um, app. Uh, you can download it from our website. So they are looking at the entire tissue section of the brain. Uh, this is a mouse brain, half mouse brain. And then they are zooming in on the hippocampus. And by changing the spot opacity, you can now see where different gene expression clusters are located within the uh, within the tissue. Or what you can, what, or what my colleague is doing here is essentially used to use a tool in the browser to only select the region that they are interested in. So they are, they just want to look at the hippocampus in this case and compare the gene expression in the hippocampus with let's say the dentai gyrus, which is the this structure here. And you can do that very easily in a, in a matter of seconds, pretty much uh, hit a button, which is actually this, this button here, this, with this icon here, and the program will, the software will run a differential expression analysis. And, um, and then you can go back to the original data and redo the analysis on a different, um, on a different part of the tissue uh, without the need for, a, uh, without the need to uh, start uh, all over again from, from scratch. 
Um, and oh, I didn't mention that, but we have a lot of resources in terms of tutorials and uh, FAS that can really help you get started with, with this type of analysis, by the way. Um, and uh, yeah, so there are many different applications, many different scientific questions you can answer with Visium. Um, here I have three examples. Um, one is a paper that was actually published a few years ago. I think this is a 2018 paper. Um, and it was published using the previous version of Visium. Um, but it shows you how powerful this technology is. And so here what we have is a, a human prostate, a prostate cancer sample. Um, a, the, uh, the, those authors prepare 12 different biopsies, and then they ask the pathologist to annotate the um, uh, stain and then annotate the, 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 the biopsies. They generated um, gene expression libraries, and then they also um, created those factor activity maps that essentially show you the expression patterns of um, or ex expression pattern of group of genes involved in a particular phenotype. And so they first saw a really good uh, correlation between the pathologist annotation and the factor activity map. And so for instance, here we have a cancer signature. So genes uh, involved in this particular type of cancer were upregulated. Um, that actually occurred in the same region where the pathologist found the, um, the cancer lesion. That is great. But I think what this was, what actually was more interesting was this missed annotation. So different biopsy. Here, the pathologist didn't, didn't annotate anything, didn't see anything obvious. But the factor activity map already showed a dysregulation in gene expression. Um, and um, this was not a missed annotation per se. So it was not a, let's say, a mistake uh, done by the pathologist. Um, simply the pathologist didn't annotate anything because there was no a visible morphological change um, that, that, um, that occurred uh, in front of his, uh, their eyes. Uh, but, the, but, but the technology picked up those changes. And so I believe this is a really nice example that shows you the power and sensitivity of this technology and, the, and, the, and, why, and also why it's so important to apply this type of analysis if you really want to see what lies underneath the surface of, of the tissue. Now, a more recent paper, this was actually published with the current version of Visium. Um, this is a neuroscience, nature neuroscience paper published in 2021. And here, the authors wanted to look at the, or to study the prefrontal human dorsolateral co uh, cortex, which is a region of the brain um, involved in um, many neuropsychiatric disorders, um, schizophrenia, aut autism, uh, autism um, developmental delay, there are just three of those. Uh, and so what they did was to uh, generate um, Visium libraries from um, a, that included all six layers of the cortex plus the white matter. And first they looked at the spatial orientation of, or spatial distribution of genes um, detected with Visium and compare it with the gold standard, which is in situ hybridization. And they found a, a, a pretty much a perfect correlation. Now, what was more important um, and more intriguing, I guess, is um, during this study, the authors also generated single nuclei RNA-seq data from the same region of the brain. And then they integrated single nuclei RNA-seq data with spatial transcriptomics data. And by doing that, they were able to demonstrate that different layers of the cortex um, actually showed a preferential enrichment, enrichment of genes that were associated to a particular neuropsychiatric disorder. And those results are summarized here in those tables. So for instance, for autism, layer two, five, and six seems to be uh, enriched in those genes. And this was possible, again, by combining single cell data with spatial transcriptomics data. That's because you get a better granularity of your data set. Um, unfortunately, something that our software cannot, th this type of analysis, something our software cannot do, um, at least now, but there are um, third party tools uh, available. Um, and if you are interested in talking a little bit more about this type of approach, uh, feel free to reach out to, to all of us um, and we can definitely provide recommendation. But, you know, um, the long story short is um, it's a very popular method, and so it's it's, it's totally uh, doable, and, uh, and the results are really are really great. Um, now, in um, 
the last example I'd like to show you, um, at least for peer-reviewed publications, is this paper. This was published, uh, I think it, was, it came out last week, um, and uh, in immunity, so a, a cell paper. And uh, in, in, this, in this study, what the authors did was to study uh, TLS, and TLS are those um, tertiary, tertiary lymphoid structure. Essentially, are, aggreg are lymphoid aggregates uh, containing T cells and B cells. And they, they, looked at, um, they looked at the structure in, um, in clear, um, in, a, in, renal cell cancer, in a renal cell cancer sample. And so they used both the FFP version of Visium and the fresh frozen version of Visium. And in total, they profiled 24 samples, uh, 12, for, um, 12 with FFP and 12 with fresh frozen samples. And the spatial analysis here actually revealed that those TLS, um, um, those TL the, the TLS actually presented different B cell maturation stages uh, up to, it, or, the, or also that include plasma cells, as we can see here. So the, um, the TLS is highlighted here in, in yellow with this dotted line. And, the T and the, if we look at the gene signature of plasma cells, we see the genes, the, this, uh, those plasma cells present in the, uh, in the TLS, uh, in those TLS. So that's, that's really interesting. And it's a, it's, a, it's a remarkable result that is made possible thanks to you know, spatial transcriptomics. Now, the other really remarkable data or result is actually here on the right. And in here, they, the, the author switched to the fresh frozen tissue or a fresh frozen solution. And because the fresh frozen solution gives you essentially full length uh, mRNA, they were, able actually, they were able to characterize um, uh, the VDJ sequences of, of B cell receptor. And by doing that, they were able to demonstrate that actually TLS, those, those structures showed the, uh, the highest number of unique clonotypes in those TLS. Um, and, uh, and the TLS were also the site of hypermutation. But then once those, uh, those, pla uh, those, um, uh, those plasma cells uh, un un uh, underwent uh, uh, hypermutation, they actually left the, uh, the TLS and disseminate through, uh, through the tumor. And which is kind of shown here, uh, I apologize for the picture, it's a little bit small, but I hope you can actually see the, uh, where I'm pointing here. So it's a, this is a really interesting paper, interesting study, uh, fresh uh, off, uh, uh, out of the press, I should say. And it essentially shows that, again, thanks to a spatial analysis, um, for the first time, those authors were able to demonstrate that TLS are site for B cell maturation, selection, and clonal amplification. And those da these data can actually be important to guide future therapeutic approaches. Now, I'd like to show you some data we also generated in house using the FFP uh, solution. And in here, we looked at, uh, pro at a prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is the most common form of cancer among men in the, in the US. It is the second um, leading cause of cancer death in the US. The first one is lung cancer. Um, so the um, diagnosis relies on the Gleason score pattern, which is where essentially a pathologist will make assessment based on the morpho morphology of the tissue. Which, and this method is great, it's been working really well. However, oftentimes you, you, know, you, 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 you do really want to see what happened underneath the surface and, and get a better understanding of the etiology of this, of this, uh, this, um, of this tumor and, um, and uh, get a better idea of the, of, the, um, of the biology of the tumor. And so what we did was to profile two different types of um, samples. A, we had a stage three adenocarcinoma and a stage four acinal cell carcinoma. And again, those were profiled using the uh, Vision for FFP solution. And here, um, we asked the pathologist to annotate the, um, this is the, um, uh, the stage three carcinoma. Um, and the pathologist found a massive area of invasive carcinoma up here. When we run Vision, we actually saw that the um, gene expression cluster really related or um, um, corresponded to the uh, pathologist annotation. So here, for instance, we have a massive cluster of, you know, in the invasive carcinoma. Then we simply divided the tissue between invasive carcinoma and benign tissue, and we look at gene expression. And this is something that you can do in loop browser in a matter of minutes. 
And the gene expression analysis actually revealed um, several genes, several typical markers um, or cancer markers that are regulated in the, um, in the invasive carcinoma as compared to the uh, benign tissue as expected. We also looked at um, as a typical biomarker or the expression of a typical biomarker, uh, AMA, AMA, CR, um, and we compare gene expression with uh, immunohistochemistry. Um, there is no expression in a normal prostate cancer, in a normal prostate sample. Um, and so we did it also see gene expression. But then when we look at the stage three or stage four uh, carcinoma, we did see expression uh, with, uh, with immunohistochemistry. And then, of course, we did, we did see expression um, with, uh, with visium. And again, the, uh, the expression um, a cor correlates or, the, uh, of, course, of course, in the same area where we see the uh, with it, where we see the protein expression. Now here, the, the pathologists also found a very, very tiny area where uh, immune cells were uh, located. However, when we actually looked at um, common B cell markers, uh, and we picked five of them uh, with Visium, we were actually able to see that actually there were way more um, immune cells than, again, what the pathologist was able to see just by naked eye. And in this particular case, for the stage three adenocarcinoma, those B cells seems to be uh, really enriched across the boundaries between the tumor and the um, benign tissue. Whereas in here, in the stage four, is asinine uh, cell carcinoma, again, B cells, same markers, they seem to be more spread across the, the entire tissue. So this, again, gives you an idea not only of what you might be missing by simply looking at a... Um, biopsy stain with H&E. Um, and so again, why it's so important to look under, to see what lies underneath the surface, but it also gives you an idea of how different the B cell distribution is uh, across two different stages of, uh, of the same um, type, of, type of cancer. And um, in the last um, five, seven, five to seven minutes, I'd like to show you what actually is coming up uh, soon with, with regards to Visium. And so, um, the, the, we, we are already able to co-stain or stay in the tissue section with up to five different antibodies plus DAPI. So you can essentially look at the tissue section with six different colors. Um, however, the, I would say the goal here is not to interrogate only five antibodies or five markers, but the goal is to interrogate doses of different proteins and, uh, and have a quantitative measurement instead of a qualitative measurement. And this would be, it would be possible thanks to a new um, uh, gene expression slide. Now we, we will be able to uh, stain a tissue section with um, oligoconjugated antibodies. It, this is similar to you know, the site seek um, approach for single cell. Um, and so by using this approach, we will be able to simultaneously measure doses of uh, proteins and gene expression from the very same tissue section and, of course, also morphology. And uh, I'll give you a, an idea here. So we have a, this is a human tonsil. This is FFP, a human tonsil sample. We use a panel of 20 different oligoconjugated antibodies. And, um, and you can see how the protein clusters um, what the protein cluster looks like uh, when we stain this section with the with those anti, with the, 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 these antibody panels, and also this is how the gene expression um, cluster um, looks like. Um, and again, this will allow you to would enable would allow you to interrogate uh, a significantly higher number of markers uh, simultaneously as compared to you know only five different antibodies. Now, there's going to be a new instrument available. Uh, this is called the Site Assist. And what it does is um, it makes possible to generate the uh, Visium libraries starting from pre mounted tissue sections or pre archived tissue section. So let's say you have a uh, FFP tissue section on a, on a typical, on a plain microscope slide and you want to um, make a gene uh, visium libraries, now will be possible uh, by using this, this instrument. And uh, again, a very high level of review of what it, what, what it makes possible. So here we have a, I believe this is a 
A, uh, E18 in uh, mouse embryos. Um, and um, it's a large embryo will not fit on a um, 6.5 by 6.5 uh, capture areas. And so this, is, this was sections and placed on a plain micros microscope slide. But now with the site assist, what you can do is to select the region of the tissue that you want to transfer on a gene expression slide. And so in here, for instance, we are transferring the head of the embryo, whereas in here we are transferring the torso of the embryo. And then, and these of course inside the, uh, inside the instrument, inside the site assist. And so when, you, when we run the libraries, here we have the, you know, the clustering from the head of the embryo, and here we have the gene, exp the gene expression clusters from the torso of the embryos. And, um, and we were able to identify um, key markers or, or canonical markers, I should say, that identify eye and the brain here, for instance, and the, uh, the, um, the ends and toe of the embryos and, and the liver. So just to give you an idea of what would be possible to do with this instrument. Uh, there is going to be also a version of the gene expression slide with, with larger capture areas. Um, so we're going to move from a 6.5 millimeter square capture areas to uh, 11 millimeter square capture areas. And also this will be compatible with the, the larger capture area will be compatible with the site assist. And um, there is, I know that there is a lot of excitement about a higher resolution of, uh, of Visium. Um, this will be available toward the end of 2022. Um, and what we're going to have is a version of Visium that will allow you to interrogate a tissue with, um, um, with, with single cell resolution. Each of those um, squares are um, less than 10 micron in, uh, in size. And so by looking at, let's say this, uh, for instance, this is, a, this, this is the eye of the embryos, then you can actually um, you know, interrogate the gene expression um, with single cell resolution using um, out of those uh, FFP uh, and then fresh, and fresh frozen tissue sections as well. And in the last two minutes, um, let me also talk about the, the newest, um, pillar we have. Um, this is an instrument that is still under development, um, but it should be available toward the end of um, 2022. And uh, it's an instrument, it's called Xenium, and is an instrument for in situ analysis. So what you'll be able to do is to um, use FFP or fresh frozen tissue section and um, interrogate, um, gene exp interrogate genes and proteins from the same section with subcellular resolutions. Um, it's not going to be a whole transcriptome because that is that is a um, that is essentially in situ analysis. Um, but you'll be able to do hundreds of different targets um, from the very same um, tissue section. And uh, um, it's not an NGS readout, so it's not a Illumina readout. Uh, the readout is a microscopy readout. And imaging and data analysis are integrated in the in the system. And so there's uh, some. Pre very preliminary data here. Uh, we see a human breast cancer um, sections, a pathologist annotated um, the, um, the section here. And here we, we stay uh, or we, uh, we, run the, uh, we run the Xenium platform on the same section um, st and stain it with a, with a panel of 200 genes. What you are seeing here, of course, are not, those are not 200 genes. This is after the first cycle of imaging. But this sample was stained with, with 200 um, uh, different, well, was stained with a panel for, uh, for 200 different genes. And the same sample, um, by doing that, what we were able to do was simply to, um, by looking at gene expression, we were able to pick two different cancer signatures that, again, the pathologist was not able to identify simply because there was not a visible difference between the cancer signature one, but or the cancer signature signature two. But then, when you look at gene expression, well, that is where actually you'll be able to really distinguish between those two those, those, uh, those two uh, different phenotypes. And again, the um, with this technology, you you will be able to interrogate gene expression with subcellular resolution and essentially count the number of transcript and also number of proteins that you have. Um, again, with subcellular resolution. And uh, yeah, so la my last slide, um, it's your local team. So um, 
I'd like to you know, introduce Eve Marie. She is your sales executive. And as a sales executive, she's pretty much the quarterback of, of the team. Um, if you haven't, you know, if you're not sure who to reach out to, um, send an email to Eve Marie. She'll be able to loop in the, the right people. Um, Adel Eckhart is your sales associate. Then you have two field application scientists, Kara Pivarsky and Joseph. Joseph is the field application scientist for spatial transcriptomics um, only, pretty much. And then you now have two uh, science and technology advisors. One is me, and the uh, second is uh, Leilani. She is she. We just hired her from Akoya, and she also be, she would be focused on this on our spatial transcriptomics so, um, solutions. Um, Last but not least, we're going to be on campus on April 28th for office hour. Um, so um, we'll be happy to meet with you and discuss your, um, we discuss your project, what you try to do, um, see how we can help you. Um, and of course, if you have data, i uh, be more than happy to, to see the data. Uh, with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I'll be more than happy to take any questions. I don't see the um, chat from my screen. Apologies. So, so, yeah, feel free to either put your questions in the chat or to just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask them. That would be fine too. And I'll share the slides. So, you'll have this one. Okay, so so yeah, good question. So the question is, will the largest slide and HD version be for both FFP and Fresh Frozen? Uh, yes. So the the largest slide are um, those are called Excel. Uh, those will be compatible for FFP, FFP as well as uh, Fresh Frozen, and um, and the same is true for Visium HD will be compatible for fresh frozen or FFP. Um, let me clarify that the Visium, 4F, uh, the, uh, Visium HD will not have a XL slide. So the capture area will still be 6.5 millimeters square for, for HD. Um, yeah, so um, I believe we're gonna. I believe we're gonna start at nine a.m. Um, if Marie, am I correct? Mm. Okay. Yes. Um, and we and we definitely we're gonna we're gonna send out information um, soon, uh, but. Um, we, we, we're gonna be we're gonna be there um, the whole the whole day, I believe. So yeah, so so the question is, will the Xenium platform require a specific instrument to capture the image? No. So good question. Um, no, because the image is actually captured by the Xenium instrument itself. So imaging and data analysis are going to be um, done or carried out. Um, on the platform. So you don't need an extra instrument. Okay. Uh, does the next have many type of tissues optimized to work with the vision? Yeah, so good question. So there, um, we, so the, the, we, we tested that large number of tissues, uh, both with FFP and, and fresh frozen. Um, perhaps it's easier for me to tell you what are those two, three tissues that still require some degree of optimization. Um, um, and, uh, and those are bone tissue. That's because um, 
you will need to decalcify the tissue before sectioning. Um, and, um, and then uh, pancreas might require some degree of optimization again. Um, skin in the sense that um, it tends to detach um, but I, I have, I personally have a, a customer who um, generated beautiful data um, with skin, with FFP, uh, with skin uh, for fresh frozen, sorry. Um, but um, those are the pretty much the only three tissue that kind of require some degree of, optim of, of, of optimization. But at the same time, also, we have, a ca we have customers who generated good, uh, good quality data on, with pancreatic tissue. And on our website, um, there is a list of, um, I can, let me actually see if I can um, quickly uh, copy and paste the uh, chat, the um, web page in the chat. We have a list of tissue we, we, we tried in, in house. Um, let me actually do that in a second. Um, it's gonna take me only a second. Okay, so, Okay, so in here, so this is the list of um, optimized tissues for fresh frozen and um, for FFP is this one here, copy and paste. FFPE, okay, copy and paste, there it is. Okay, um, if you have, the microbiome, oh, that's, that's a very interesting, um, that's a very interesting uh, question. Um, so the, I think we can, Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that offline, but um, with fresh frozen, so the thing is, the, there are ways, I guess, to identify the microbiome. Um, perhaps vision for, vision for fre uh, FFP would be a little bit um, easier to use uh, because um, I assu I'm assuming the micro, so those, those um, bacterial, um, so the, the microbiome would be would be bacteria. So um, they they don't have a poly A mRNA, and so we can't really capture them. There could be a way to stain bacteria um, using a fresh frozen um, stain the section using. Uh, but perhaps we can talk about that a little bit more um, offline. I think uh, um, it might be a little bit easier to use FFP because because this is a probe based approach. And I um, and I had a similar conversation with a different with another customer. Oh, any news? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I, I we don't have any uh, any new updates regarding um, rat probes for Vision for FFP. But um, thanks for pointing it out. Uh, pointing this out, we 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 can. Uh, this is actually the, inf the, the information we do need, so that we can actually pass it along to our uh, to our team. Um, we can talk about using the mouse panel um, and see if that will answer your questions. Um, so um, I believe there are um, that there is of course some degree of um, similarity, some degree of some degree of similarity that might actually help you answer at least some preliminary question. Okay, 60% compare. Okay, perfect. Mm. Yeah, I mean the you know what I what I also wonder is 60% compatible, so 40% is not compatible, but um in that 60% compatible, I would wonder um how so where the mismatch are uh, and how many how many probes show let's say one mismatch or two mismatches or three mismatches um and uh 
perhaps in the 60% compatibility, um, you, ha you have the vast majority of genes that you are interested in studying. So that could be, um, could be maybe a, something to, to think about. But yeah, again, maybe we can, again, take these offline uh, and or discuss one-to-one uh, -one and see if we can, um, we can come up with a strategy. Another couple seconds for people to think about questions here. <laughs> um, I hope I answer, I didn't skip any one question. What are the, the sequencing requirement for? Oh, yeah, good point. So, yeah, so there is a difference in the sequencing in the minimum required minimum recommended sequencing depth between fresh frozen and FFP. Um, that's because the with the FFP chemistry, we don't, we only capture protein coding genes. So we don't capture mitochondrial genes, we don't capture ribosomal protein genes. Um, and so for, uh, for, for fresh frozen, the minimum required, the minimum recommended sequencing depth is 50,000 rib pairs per spot covered by, the, by tissue. For FFP, is 25,000, so it's half of the um, of, of fresh frozen, uh, half compared to fresh frozen. How large is the AOI? Um, I'm sorry, I'm very bad with acronyms. I'm from a I'm from a country where we don't have acronyms. <laughs> um, oh, Ariel. Okay, thank you. Um, so for um, so for 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 Visium, so essentially you don't have a area of interest, you have a capture area, which is the 6.5 millimeter square. And then we're gonna have the 11 millimeter square with the Visium Excel. Um, and so we don't really talk about region of interest or area of interest because we don't need to select any of, uh, we don't need to select a region of interest before starting the experiment. You, you always, you place your tissue section that will cover a certain number of spots that are already there, that are already on the slide. And so you will always profile the entire tissue section, um, unlike the other platform where you first need to decide what, are, uh, um, what part of the tissue you want to look at. So you need first need to establish, uh, decide uh, on ROI and then look at those ROIs. Okay, good. so are the RNA and protein panels fixed for human mouth or can be customized? So um, that's a so good question. So for the RNA so far, um, for FFP, R RNA is essentially, we have mouse and human, uh, hopefully we're gonna expand it to rat and non-human primates. So that is not really um, customizable in the sense that we don't do that, but, um, but we can, if you are interested in spiking in probes, we can definitely have a conversation uh, and, uh, and talk about a kind of an off protocol um, approach to do that. For proteins, um, what, we gonna, what, we, what you can do right now with immunofluorescence, you can use pretty much any antibodies. Uh, when we're going to have the uh, feature barcode or the oligo conjugated antibodies, um, so we're going to, Initially, we're gonna provide panels of antibodies. Um, they would include something in the ballpark range of 30 antibodies or so, and then we're gonna expand those. Uh, we, we, we're gonna expand those. Um, and, and then we're gonna also have a, the, the, the possibility of, ca of customizing um, those, those panels. Oh, I think it was regarding Xenium. Oh, that is... Um, so again, that my under, so that is still a 
under development, uh, my understanding is that there's going to be panels of, of, of um, genes and panels of, of proteins. Um, would it be customiz customizable? My gut feeling is yes, because this is what we tend to do also with, um, um, with, that, with other applications. Um, I don't, I honestly, I don't know if this is going to be um, immediately available at launch. Um, again, because the instrument is still kind of under development. Um, but it, I, my, my gut feeling again is it will be eventually um, uh, available, a like sort of customization. Um, yeah. Sure. Okay, looks like we're at about 2.30. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Egon. This has been um, a, a really great presentation. Thank you. Um, and if anybody has any follow-up questions, um, I think we have the contact information um, on the UWBC Biotech Talk website. And also this was recorded, um, so we'll be able to share that recording as well out on the website. Oh, Sandra, Sandra wants to be unmuted, so let me unmute her really quick. Um, all right. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> I just wanted to let everyone know that on March 22nd, from 10 to noon, we are hosting an 10x genomics and Illumina seminar, which will be the second core grant program on campus. And this core grant program will give um, junior faculty professors an opportunity to submit an application for a 10x single cell pilot experiment. The applications will be judged by 10x personnel and the winners will be awarded reagents and sequencing for a small pilot scale. And that seminar will be kicked off again on March 22nd, hosted at the UW Biotechnology Center in the auditorium it will be from 10 till noon. Both 10X and Illumina will give presentations as well as two professors, Dr. Chris Saha and Ting Zhu, I believe from Bo Lee's lab, who were winners of the first core grant program back in 2019, who won reagents and sequencing um, from those award submissions. So keep your eye out from email coming from the Biotechnology Center, as well as from Liz Jesse and from our 10X and Illumina sponsors as well. Thank you. <laughs>